Okay, this is Wayne coming at you. So preparing for your trip to Southeast Asia, particularly Thailand or whatnot, uh, come to the store and get yourself this. Yep, you read it right, $69.95. You might be able to find it cheaper other places. Magic Jack Plus. Now you can take this with you when you go overseas and you will uh, be able to make calls back to the U.S. for free. It won't cost you any more than that. You get a year subscription automatic with that. It's only like 30 bucks a year after that, so it's a really good deal. And uh, you can make calls back here. Now, you need to plug a phone into this after it's plugged into your computer, or you can plug this in uh, like this. You can get the uh, plug adapter to go with it. Uh, this one might come with it, I'm not sure. But um, here you go. Now you can come and get these cheap phones. Emerson makes these, six bucks, and that'll just be your it's small, light, portable, cheap. You can just take it along with you, and there's your phone. Uh, or you can come down and spend a little bit more, about ten bucks, and you can buy this one, which is a uh, slimline. It's got caller ID too, which, by the way, the Magic Jack also gives you caller ID, so if you want to screen your calls, you can do that. This is an awesome deal. Um, and I said, uh, I don't think it comes with the receptacle plug. I'm not sure. Uh, the plug in the wall, but you can always order it. Uh, it might, though. I'll tell you when I open mine. I'm grabbing one for, for my trip over there right now. And uh, a phone. So, uh, there you go. Okay, one other thing a lot of people don't really think about when traveling overseas. You should carry a compass, even a little one like this. Just have a compass on you, because you never know when you're going to get you know, confused and need to just figure out direction. Because uh, if you're not near the ocean, it's usually, a hard, it's usually hard to tell where you are or which direction you're facing, especially in mountainous regions. You can spend a couple more dollars to get one like this that you can use on a map for plotting your course. Uh, I take these actually with me when I go there, a, a directional view a plotter like this, and also one like this. Um, that I carry with my maps and everything. Uh, you can learn uh, on YouTube, just jump on and look around and you can find uh, tutorials on how to use these. Uh, people made a lot of videos on how to use uh, compass maps and have maps on compasses, or compasses on maps. And uh, you know, that'll help you out a lot when you're over there. If you're like me, I trek in the wilderness a lot and into the jungle looking for, I do photography, so this is also a definite need for me every time I go over, okay? So uh, that should help you out a little bit. Make sure you bring one with you, even a little one. Another thing I carry um, when I go overseas too, anywhere I go like that, I'm a little bit of a survivalist uh, mentality person, um, but I carry water purification tablets. Um, and these you can drop in the water at uh, even some pretty nasty lakes and if you're absolutely in a situation that you need it. You can only survive a couple days without water. So. Uh, this is definitely something that, you know, for five, six bucks, throw it in your bag. Why not? You know, just so you have it in case you end up needing it. Hopefully you don't. But if you're like me and you trek in the woods and you like to go to the big state parks and things like that, you know, you never know you could get lost. This would be something that would uh, keep you alive a little longer. Okay? And here's one last thing that's pretty good to have on you. It's a little multi-tool. doesn't have to be this one. This is <laughs> pretty cheap. But hey, it works, right? It's made of metal. Uh, you're right here, you have a fork, a knife, and a spoon. And you can use it as a bottle opener. And also you have the, the wine opener too, but um, this will this will come in handy just as a added insurance to put into your backpack. So you definitely have a use of you know these tools. Pretty standard tools that you need everywhere in life, right? <laughs> okay, here are a couple things I have here that uh, are definitely gonna be useful on going overseas all of you should have for your trip. Um, this one is actually a money belt thing. Uh, it can go through a belt, as you can see, like this, and through this one. And it's got a clip. And the clip you can use to put it just inside your pants, clip it on, or anywhere you can find the fasten it where you, where you could need it. Um, this can fit a passport in it. It's the size of a passport. And now uh, you can hold your documents and your international driver's license, whatever, money mainly in it. So this is something you should have. You should have multiple, remember, not just one money belt. A few different types. Here's one. It's going to be a little more convenient to work with. Here is an ankle or a leg strap one. And as you can see, it's Velcro. And it, uh, it, uh, 
unzaps. You can wrap this around your leg. It holds a passport size too. Um, this one's quite spacious to put some stuff in. It's got a couple different compartments, two zippers. And uh, you can slide all your stuff in. It dries really fast if it gets hot, and it's uh, pretty weather resistant as far as it doesn't let a lot of moisture in. So you don't have to worry too much about water getting in it. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's under your pants anyway. So it's protected. So that's that. Um, then we have this one, which is the standard money belt. This is the one that goes around your waist. Yeah, it clips. It uh, holds passport and a lot of money. This one can fit a lot more money than the others. Um, unzip two compartments. The front one's going to be mainly bill size. The back one's going to be passport and other document size as well as you can put bills in. Uh, very good to have. This is definitely a requirement for going overseas if you're going to carry any money around on you. Uh, like me, you tend to carry quite a bit. Um, so these three options here, they also make a belt that's an actual leather belt that fits in your belt loops. It just looks like a normal belt, except on the inside of it has a zipper. And you can fold up bills and put them in there folded, and that's like an emergency fund belt. Um, that can hold, you know, well, if you put in $100 bills, of course, it's going to hold a lot. But, um, you know, I'm going to put something like that in. So that's a fourth option. But uh, these three right here are definitely needed for overseas travel. I recommend getting each of them. Um, I got mine at AAA. Uh, well, some of them I ordered one online, but uh, basically got this at AAA for about, I don't know, 12, 13 bucks, something like that. Uh, got this one online for about 20, and I got this one for like 10 bucks at uh, AAA. So uh, there you go, those three. And I'll also show you some other money hiding things you should have with you. And we're back. Okay, this one, something else you should carry. You can get these at Home Depot or order them online but uh it actually has the weight of a full soda okay dr pepper you can get them in a few different ones it's an actual soda can okay and but when you grab the rim and you twist it un goes and inside you see inside there's a little place to hide jewelry money um, mainly use them for cash uh, computer chips, you know, if you have a little SD card or something you want to hide because it has important information, banking or something, you can put it in this. Now, I do recommend for customs when you're coming into the country, uh, in any Asian country or wherever you're going, um, buy one of these in the plastic casing with all the directions with it and everything, and uh, bring it in that. Don't remove it and have it like this when you go. Because uh, it could cause a little problem at customs, you know. But when they see it's something you purchased to hide money in or whatever, then they feel a little better. You know, they might open it and look at it. But if you've already got it open, then it kind of bothers them a little when they you don't show it right quick to them or something, you know. It bothers them a little. So this is good. You can put this in your cupboards at your place you're renting. And uh, no one will be the wiser unless the thief gets thirsty and uh, comes in and wants a Dr. Pepper. But <laughs> you could also get some, maybe maybe get an off brand that's something nasty nobody likes. <laughs> but yeah, this this is pretty good for hiding, you know, some stuff in so you ain't gotta worry about the cleaning lady so much. And I'd buy another case once I got there of Dr. Pepper just like this and put this one all the way in the back and all the other ones in the front. That way if anybody does take one they take the front one and not this one in the back. Okay. Okay, and another thing you should have always with your passport, oops, there's mine, is uh, one thing you'll notice on your passport nowadays is right here. This means there's a radio frequency chip inside, or RF chip, inside your passport. And you can find these on like American Express credit cards too. They actually have chips in them now. And this is, this is actually an issue for uh, your you know, safety overseas. Um, I buy these cases that uh, or actually have a uh, blocker inside and I'm pretty sure it's probably made of um, of uh, brass like real fine mesh brass because what it does is it blocks a scanner from being able to scan this because they actually have things now that guy can just walk by you and not even touch you and just wave the scanner near your pocket and it'll grab the, all the information off of this or your credit cards so you can put your credit cards in these too to protect them if they have RF uh, things inside them but um, this one, uh, this one has it. And uh, the other thing is, um, there's even ones more powerful now. 
people are carrying antennas that go down their leg and up their back and stuff that uh, are really, really able to pick up every one of this, these RF things up to 30, 40 feet away. So, I mean, that's scary. And, um, you know, they could even drive by you in a vehicle while you're standing on a corner. So it's always, I think, good to invest the 10 bucks or 20 or whatever you're going to pay for it in one of these RF blockers that doesn't allow this, this signal to get through. And uh, that'll, that's a good thing to have. I have a couple of them. I'll show you the other one, too. All right, so here's the other one. This is also an RF blocker. As you can see, you put your credit cards in there. And uh, you can put your driver's license, too. You don't have to, but I mean, carry it all together. It's nice and neat. This one actually has individual pockets for all your credit cards to go into, as well as uh, a thing here. You can put all your information and slide your passport into this piece. Right here is a little flap. Your passport will hook into there. And then uh, you can close it all up. And no RF signal goes through this. So you don't have to worry about... Um, anybody hijacking your information so uh, and it doesn't say US passport right on the front so everybody knows that you steal it from you so uh, it's a little more discreet and a little nicer to have another thing I want to discuss is uh, your jewelry and your watch now when you're going overseas especially into these countries which are uh, I wouldn't say third world because uh, like Thailand is definitely not third world but um, you know you might go to Cambodia which can be or parts of India. Um, Americans like to be flashy, we like nice things. Something like this, you know, well over a thousand dollar watch, it's not a smart thing to be wearing when you go over there. So if I was you, leave this at home. Leave this, your gold, you know, stuff like that. Leave that at home. You don't want to advertise, hey, rich, stupid American, come rob me, you know, or stab me in a back alley, please. As well as the fact you walk up wearing stuff like this, you know, these people will, you know, charge you more money when you buy things. They say, hey, this guy's rich. Let me charge him an extra five dollars for that. You know, so uh, good thing not to not to dress like that quite. So just go out and get yourself. I mean, this is a really nice watch right here. It's probably about 50, 60 bucks. It's, uh, you know, it's got all the, all the bells and whistles that um, any of the other high-end watches have. It just, it's not, you know, thousands of dollars. So it's a Pulsar, actually, this one. Conograph. So, you know, you've got what you need here. And uh, so, yeah, if I was you, go out and buy yourself something like this. It's nice, it's fashionable, it works. And uh, it's, you know, a good watch. But it's 50 bucks. It's not, you know, over $1,000. And then this gets you in trouble over there. So flash this around when you're trying to pick up girls in America. You know, we know how they are. So, But don't bring this over to Asia or to any other country. It's not wise. And uh, leave your gold chains and your diamond earrings and all at home. So I hope this has helped you. Here's, uh, like I said, all these little devices that are gonna, are kind of, I call a required survival kit for traveling overseas, and then uh, especially in a third world country like uh, Cambodia or something like that. This is definitely stuff that you might want to have. Okay, so hope you had fun. Okay, yeah, so I almost forgot. Uh, speaking about gold, actually. Um, as you can see, a lot of you might have your nice gold chain that you like to wear. This is mine. I, I wore this for a very long time. I enjoy it. Um, it's got sentimental value to me, too. Um, this is one trick about gold in other countries. Um, like I said, with the watches, same applies to gold. You really shouldn't take this with you overseas. Uh, if you want, when you get to that country, buy a fake one and <laughs> pimp it like it's real. But uh, here's the other thing. Um, some countries don't allow gold don't allow um, their citizens to own gold or the travelers coming through their country to possess gold. So, uh, I mean, your gold earrings, your gold rings, you know, wedding bands, I know that a lot of times they make uh, exception for and they don't give you trouble on. But uh, something like this, they will. And uh, so, like I said, some countries will not even allow you to enter the country with gold. They'll confiscate it or force you to mail it back, which it could get lost in the mail. A lot of things can happen. You can uh, lose your gold. So uh, probably a good idea not to bring it. And other countries will tax you on your gold, too. So you already own your gold. Uh, imagine take a, you know, three, four thousand gold dollar gold chain that you suddenly get taxed two thousand dollars on. Yeah, now you just pay two thousand more for the chain you already bought. Um, or Again, like I said, uh, maybe they missed it and let you get it in the country. On the way out, they try to confiscate it because they think you're taking gold from their country. And that's another thing. A lot of them don't allow you to remove gold from their country. 
or uh, you know things like that. So I'd be careful as you. Uh, some also have gold requirements that they only allow, you know, 10 grams of gold or something on you. And obviously this is going to weigh a lot more than that. This is over an ounce. Um, so just know that don't uh, don't bring gold overseas if you can help it. Unless you're a gold dealer or something, and then you better research the laws of that country before you bring it. Okay. Here's another nifty thing to have while you're overseas. Um, and they can get it open a little bit, but not much. Can't really get in anything in there. But uh, this is actually a really nice design they have here. And as you can see, you have locks. Uh, this is the TSA uh, release. They can put their key in there, and the the uh, travel police there can open it up and see what's inside your bag um, in case they have to search it rather than cut your locks off. Now this is actually a very nice little thing here. This is a hard case and it's made by uh, Samsonite. Oh, let's turn it this way. So this is made by Samsonite and it's a hard case. I like that. Um, I really like that. And when traveling in the countries where, you know, especially where drugs are an issue like Thailand, um, I like a locking case. Um, I don't want to have maybe an airport baggage handler decide he's going to smuggle to his buddy that's an airport baggage handler in the other country uh, a key of cocaine. So what he's going to do is he's going to open your bag and put a key of coke in here and hope his buddy on the other side finds it before it makes it off, off onto the trolley thing for you. And then you get to walk in the customs, like I've heard has happened, and open your bag with a kilo of cocaine in it. Yeah, not too nice spending the rest of your life in a Thai prison or being executed for it. Um, so, I like a locked bag. I don't have to worry about that. It's locked. Nobody can get in it. Um, this one has uh, uh, little code rollers underneath that you can roll to open your bag. And uh, so all you do is you, and then I have the release. And this is what's so nifty about this. It just releases these. And then I can unzip and unzip and I can open my bag and go inside if I want. And then I put them back. I just make sure your, your code's locked on. Uh, Samsonite makes this bag and you just put them back in and snap them into this thing. You roll your roller so that the combination's wrong and then nobody can open it. And uh, that's nice and secure. It's a hard case. Hard case is seen, I think, uh, a little better for overseas travel too. Because uh, you know, it's a little tougher and it's just nice to have them. And you ain't got to worry about anybody really cutting your bag too easy to get in there. They'll pass this up to go mess with the cloth bag. And uh, it's got handles, a 360 roller, so it roll, spins 360 degrees, has the handle, pulls out, and rolls behind you. And this one is is 59 inches. I think the maximum you're allowed to have is 62 inches, for especially for international travel. Um, so this is 59 inches, so this is legal for all air carriers to, uh, to be a checked bag. Just keep it under 50 pounds or so. Some of them are up to 70 pounds, matters what airline you're on. But most of them are about 50 pounds, so if you keep it under that, you're good. And uh, I got two of these I take with me. One in gray and one in or silver and one in blue. So, uh, yeah, this is a really nice lock design. I really like this. So I don't have to have a separate lock I could lose or anything like that, or a key I could lose. It has a combination. It has these that lock directly into it, which is nifty for me. Okay. Okay, people, here's one other quick little thing you need to do. Before you travel overseas, go here. Yes, the CIA. Yes, they're not just a bunch of secret pricks that go around messing with people's lives. Uh, they also actually do a lot to help protect you. So, uh, you yeah, know, they're not just what you see in the movies. They're also a government agency who's tasked with letting us know what's going on everywhere else in the world. Now, something you need off this website for any trip overseas I highly recommend. You can look into a lot of things on here, but um, the biggest one for me is the World Factbook. Yes, that's the World Factbook, not the not the World Facebook. <laughs> it's the World Factbook, and it's right here. So we can click on that. Sorry, my notebook's a little slow, and uh, it will pull up the uh, World Factbook. In here, you can look up information on every country in the world. And uh, it'll tell you what our relationship is with them, what their population's like, do's and don'ts, little you know facts you might want to learn about um, before you go to a country. So now let's say we go to Southeast Asia, so we'll click on that. Okay, now that we're in Southeast Asia, what country do we want to look at? Well, let's... Uh, 
Well, let's make it easy. Let's go to Thailand. So we click on Thailand. I don't know why my page just got so small. There we go. Alright, so now, it gives us a little map. We can actually look at Thailand. We can see kind of what uh, what's involved there. Let me shut this light out so we can actually see here. <laughs> yeah, there's, uh, that's Thailand. It tells you all about the countries it borders, shows you their flag. So there's all this good stuff. And then as you scroll down, you get into the headings. And the headings are pretty good. You know, there's an introduction to Thailand. It'll explain all about their their economy and what they're like and their relationship to us. There you go, and you can start reading. Uh, it gives you a little background information about them. It tells you, you know, hey, ties aren't crazy. <laughs> okay, and then we can go down. You get the geography. You get to learn about the geography of the country. The people in their society. You get to learn about that. Um, the government. You get to learn what kind of government it is. Whether it's uh, socialist, communist, uh, capitalist, uh, regime. You know, what, what you're dealing with here. Uh, monarchy is what... Um, what some of them are. Um, the economic, you know, tells you kind of what the what the GDP is like there, what they are, their, you know, what their income is, what they make money off, what they don't make money off, you know, what they import, what they export. All these good things kind of tell you the per capita, you know, how much each person uh, gets over there. You know, it kind of gives you an idea. You can compare it to us. And they tell you what in the world, like uh, country comparison to the world. Okay, and they're like GDP and everything like that is 25. So they rank 25th in the world for their GDP, which uh, you know is pretty good. You know, uh, we are one of the top countries, but they are 25th, so that's not too bad. Um, you know, the gro the GDP growth rate for the country 1.5. I know Thailand used to be much much higher. Uh, since they installed condoms and uh, started getting the Thai men to use condoms, the growth, the birth rate has gone way down. Um, originally it was a problem with the size of the condom being too big because Americans were supplying the condoms and uh, they needed to be smaller. I am not joking, that is a fact, you can look it up. So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so they were falling off on the men, they didn't want to wear them, so they, they made a Thai condom. This is another issue for you men going to Thailand who plan to sleep with somebody while you are there. Please bring condoms with you, especially if you are a larger man. You will not find, very, very hard to find large condoms in Thailand or even normal American sizes. Um, you can, but um, most condoms are Thai size condom, and unless you want to get HIV, I'd be real careful there. I wouldn't be not wearing them. Um, so anyway, yeah, you get a that'll give you an idea on all the financial part of their uh, economy there. Um, also, the communications uh, Thais, a lot of them speak at least broken English, so you know you're going to be pretty good on your communication there. Uh, transportation is really well. I mean, it's it's not Singapore, but it's really good. I mean, you there you've got everything from boats to uh, I mean, you travel boats up the rivers to get places. That's one of the quicker, cheaper ways to travel. You travel by motorcycle in the back, you know, the, like a motorcycle taxi. The tuk tuk, which is like a motorcycle with like a little carriage on the back. Uh, you've got buses. You've got you know taxis. You've got limo. Their limo though is not our stretch limo. Their limo is like a Mercedes-Benz, you know, E-Series comes and picks you up. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, they have trains, subway, elevated trains. Um, they got it all. So, I mean, they're a very good transportation country, especially around Bangkok and places like that. So you don't have transportation issues there. Uh, military explains to you about Thai military and what their role is in the country and everything like that. And uh, transnational issues, you know, we'll tell you about issues between the two countries. Uh, disputes and, and problems that may be happening with other countries uh, so you might want to stay away from like the Burma border or something you know because you might you know have a problem there or something um, and refugee displacement trafficking persons for sex or you know whatever reasons they're trafficking them um, you know it tells you about illicit drugs uh, one big thing about a country like Thailand you might want to learn their drug laws if you use drugs and I know a lot of you Americans don't consider marijuana a drug, but I'm going to tell you now, you get caught in Thailand with one joint, you're going away for a very long time. 
ties do not play with drugs and uh, you know a pot seed could put you in prison for 20 years in Thailand and a Thai prison would not be fun for an American we don't get they don't get the uh, privileges our American prisoners get um, and something else that you're going to want to look out for is you know some countries also like uh, Singapore has a mandatory death sentence for drugs yes buddy a mandatory death sentence so uh, you might want to reconsider that as well as some of these countries like uh, Thailand you don't have a right to refuse a drug test um, they do drug screenings in some of their bars and clubs um, you might be in there having a good time at a bar one night in Bangkok and uh, next thing you know in comes walking the Thai police and they mandatorily drug test everybody in the bar and I'm gonna let you know now that just because you may have smoked pot in Amsterdam Holland and then flew to Thailand they don't consider that they still consider that as drug possession in the kingdom so you will be arrested um, they might not put you in prison for 20 years, but even a year would suck over something like that. So I highly recommend you stop smoking pot before you go to Thailand and do not bring any drugs other than your prescriptions. And I definitely check into that while I was, uh, before I went and make sure that everything's legit and you have your prescriptions and make sure that some prescriptions they won't allow you like opiates to bring into the country. But once you're there, you can get a prescription. Um, anything but uh, class A narcotics and, um, for your drugs, uh, anything that isn't class A narcotics, uh, opiates, things like that, I could, uh, I don't know, uh, Demerol, morphine, things, you know, whatever, uh, your, your more, you know, pain killing drugs, uh, are, uh, prescription needed in Thailand, but, um, other drugs like antibiotics and, you know, things like that, even Sudafed or something like that, that maybe here you would have to have a prescription to, to get. Um, in Thailand, you do not need a prescription for those drugs. Therefore, if you needed to buy um, uh, uh, antibiotic uh, penicillin, here in this country, you can't just go into a drugstore and buy penicillin. You need a prescription for penicillin, amoxicillin, uh, soma, you know, things like that. Uh, over in Thailand, you do not. You can walk into any pharmacy and just tell them the drug you want and you can purchase it. Uh, just a little tidbit of information for you guys if you get sick, you know and self-medicate you don't really need a doctor if you don't want to although doctors are extremely cheap in Thailand and I highly recommend you getting a little medical tourism in while you're over there you know some dental work whatever you need done because you're gonna pay uh, remarkably less for it there than you would here in the States so yes the uh, CIA fact book is uh, a great thing for you if you're gonna be traveling overseas to any country check it out as well as there's some other websites you can Google um, ones with the names like, uh, uh, I can't remember offhand, but um, things that you shouldn't do in other countries, things like that, um, like uh, touching the top of someone's head is disrespectful in Buddhist culture, um, as well as, you know, there's a lot of different things like Singapore, you can't have bubble gum. No chewing gum in Singapore, in Singapore people, yes, it is a jailable offense in Singapore. Um, yeah, stuff like that that you should really learn, like pointing the bottom of your feet at somebody is disrespectful. Um, you know, don't point at people, period. It's probably a good idea while you're overseas. Uh, same thing like some of our presidents found out the hard way. The peace sign is not universal. It's actually the FU sign in some countries in Europe. So just know that, that the peace sign is not a universal sign of peace. You may be flipping them the bird. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I hope you have a great time, and don't worry, I know this can be a little stressful if it's your first time leaving the country, but um, these, uh, they're just giving you some tips that are going to make things a lot nicer when you get there. Another great thing to do before you go is uh, try to purchase from your bank some of their local currency before you leave. That way you have, you know, a couple hundred bucks on you of the local currency. Um, another thing is right when you get to the airport it's usually safest for the best exchange rates that while you're at the airport in that country before you leave their airport try to change your money from American dollar to Thai baht or whatever the currency of the country you're entering is um, usually you'll get a better rate from their airports or more uh, professional and legitimate and uh, than you will in some of the other areas as well as another thing for your banking um, when you go over Sees, it's a good idea to order a duplicate debit card because uh, most banks can take two to four weeks to send you a debit card. So, uh, and a lot of them don't have an emergency debit card like function. Order extra checks. 
Um, if you have somebody here that can hold a book for you that you trust, your mother, your father, you know, your sister, whatever, um, wife, whatever you have, um, good idea to leave a book with them in case they have to write a check for you on your account over here for something or whatever. Um, but get an extra debit card to bring with you. Uh, make sure try to have a credit card with you too, uh, something with at least, you know, $5,000 or something or a couple thousand at least on the limit. So in case of an emergency, you have a credit card while you're there. Um, remember, an international driver's license is another big thing. I'm going to show you mine here in a minute. And uh, that's a very important thing you should have with you when you go overseas if you plan to drive. Even if you don't have it anyway because you might want to drive. You might change your mind once you're there. Um, so, yeah, an international driver's license you can get from AAA. Uh, look it up on the internet if you want. Find other places too. Uh, but uh, yeah, they're, you know, 10, 20 bucks, you know, matters where you're going, what countries and whatnot. Check with your insurance, make sure it covers rentals in other countries and that you're covered from your insurance overseas. Um, these are all things you should be taking care of before you leave. Call your bank, let your bank know that you are, your travel dates, when you're going to be and where you're going to be. That way your bank can actually um, not uh, have, like my bank, I'm with Wells Fargo, used to be Wachovia. And whenever a transaction happens overseas with mine, they like to freeze my account, or at least freeze the transaction, to find out if I made that transaction. And if they can't get a hold of you because you don't have a phone number or whatnot and you're overseas, they may cancel your card on you or freeze it, and then that's a real pain to unfreeze from overseas. So it's a good idea to let them know ahead of time, hey, yeah, I'm going to Thailand or wherever I'm going, and I'm going to be out of the country for uh, you know a month, three months, uh, two weeks, whatever you're going to do, and uh, let them know. That way they can, um, ahead of time, go and uh, put that into their computer. So when they see these transactions start happening, like right when you get to the airport and you buy a soda, they know it's not a stolen credit card <laughs> that suddenly went 10,000 miles away. They know that it's you over in Asia when they see it on the computer, so uh, you know, you're safe with that. Um, yeah, so things like that, having your financial things in order is really good. Um, having your emergency contacts all worked out. The CIA also has what's called the STEP program, S-T-E-P. Uh, I don't remember what the abbreviation's for. I could find it on here, I'm sure it's here. Uh, you can sign up through your embassy with it, the United States STEP program with the CIA. What that does is I highly recommend you do that. You report where you're going to be and where you're going to be staying in when you're in country. Uh, you report to the embassy or consulate right when you get there. You let them know, yeah, I'm going to be in uh, Thailand for three months. This is the address I'm going to be staying at. Any friends or contacts you have in that country, let them know. Let them know your contacts and people here in the United States your family, your friends, um, and what they will do with that is uh, if something happens, a war breaks out, you know, at any time it could, or, you know, terrorist activity or whatever happens, happens. Um, that information is critical to them to get you out of the country. Now, something is, is they will remove you from the country with certain circumstances. Um, natural disasters, if they have the logistics in country to do it. And it could be military removal. You could have meeting points that you're supposed to meet them at if you can, or uh, you know they come in and try to find you if they if they have the manpower at the time to do it. Um, but if they do come in and find you, um, just know that uh, you will be flown back to the United States. Everything will be taken care of. But when after you return, you will be responsible for the plan, the airfare, and everything for them to get you out of the country which could be several thousand dollars, but it could be the difference between you being alive and you not being alive. So, you know, if our government bills you $5,000 to get you out of the country in an emergency, you know, pay them back. It's, you know, a good thing they did for you. You're still alive. <laughs> so uh, just a little information, tidbits that can help you out when you're, uh, when you're overseas and doing your thing. So, um, yeah, always alert your embassy and, and consulate that you are in that country. If any, for any reason you are arrested in this in one of these countries, know that you are required to be under their law. So, um, you know, you do something that's against their laws, it'd probably be a good idea if you go get a book and learn about their laws or read it online at least before you go. Because if you get arrested, you're going to be under their law. Um, there's not a whole lot America can do for you if you were didn't doing something illegal other than a little advice and contacts and you know, what not. Um, but if you are arrested over in another country, the first things out of your mouth is, I want to speak to my embassy. Contact my consulate. Now, most countries have an agreement and a treaty that uh, 
they will contact the embassy within 24 hours or 48 hours or whatever after they have uh, detained you. Um, so it's best just to sit back, don't say anything to anybody, don't make any statements other than who you are, your name, address, phone number, you know, your basic information, just like if you were in the military. Do not give them, do not discuss the, what happened, do not discuss the case. Um, these are not your friends. Um, and a lot of times in some of these countries, they do like to make examples out of Americans. I'm um, not necessarily saying Thailand or anything like that, but um, or any specific country, but some countries are like that. So just keep your mouth shut until the embassy comes and sees you, and they will send somebody out to speak with you. If it takes a few days, just bite your lip and hold on. If they interrogate you, remember who interrogated you, um, how long you were in the room, what happened. Try to remember these things because we have treaties and embargoes with these or treaties with these countries about the treatment of our prisoners. Um, so, you know, try to remember everything about the situation that happened while you were in there. And uh, this could be the difference between you going in front of a firing squad or you going home. So just remember, keep your mouth shut. Don't be disrespectful. Don't say anything rude to anybody. Just be quiet and ask to speak to the embassy. That's all. Give them your name, your information, um, and that's it. Okay? All right. I hope this helped.